Egypt's new and renewable energy authority has signed an agreement with Abu Dhabi's future energy company Mazda and Infinity Power to build a 10 gigawatt offshore onshore wind farm in Egypt. The project looks to be one of the largest wind farms globally and is part of Mazda's commitment to supporting Africa's nations in achieving their renewable energy objectives. Mazda has also signed deals to develop renewable energy projects in Angola, Uganda and Zambia. Now joining me to discuss uh, this big development further, uh, Dr. Tolu Awoyinfa, energy specialist in London, and here in Alego Studios, Mustafa Lau, who is the head of research at AIM Securities. Uh, it's great to have you this morning, both, madam, and uh, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate that. So um, uh, let's start with you, uh, Awoyinfa. Let's start at ten billion dollars for this project. What is the Egyptian government telling the rest of the world about the potential of wind energy? Thank you. Um, it's certainly a bold step, and I would say it's a bold step in the right direction. It's quite interesting that Egypt is going this route as the majority of their supply is already been, um, majority of their power supply is generated from thermal, hydropower, and also from wind farms. Um, but however, it's quite interesting also that there are regions in Egypt that are very amenable to wind generated power. And it's a great signal that this wind power can be harnessed on the African continent on a scale of this nature. Interesting. Uh, Mustafa, let me ask you, the wind farm is expected to produce about 47,790 gigawatts of energy, clean energy annually. Does that kind of output justify $10 billion investment? Um, yes. Yeah, so if you look at it uh, from a consumption perspective, uh, not only would Egypt be able to save 9% of its CO2 emissions, but it would also be able to save $5 billion annually in terms of its natural gas production costs. So last year, for example, if you look in Egypt, Egypt were selling their natural gas at a price of about $3 per million uh, British thermal units. However, if they were to sell it for exports, it would have been about $30 uh, million British thermal units. So there's a lot of money that could be saved. You know, should, we, should we see um, alternative sources of uh, energy coming to play there? And also, if you look at it from perspective of, of uh, of FX, that is more FX revenue. Also, if you look at it from a comparative perspective as well, we have Lake Turkana in Kenya, for example, that was built for $680 million. And the $10 billion investment here for Egypt, that is going to be about 15 times more than that. But if you look at the output, uh, this Egyptian project is going to have 47,790 gigawatt hours. Whereas in Kenya, the $680 million project, that's outputting about 1,250 gigawatts hour, so about 38 times that. So I would say on the balance of factors, it is, it is, a, it is a worth it because it's a strategic, strategic investment and it could you know, benefit Egypt in other, other ways aside from just the um, electricity, electricity production long term. Uh, interesting. Um, uh, when you find a wind farm is expected to reduce 90% of Egypt's carbon emissions, I'm sure you know since COP27, Egypt has been trying very hard to ensure that, yes, it hosted the first uh, COP on the African continent. So they're very excited that they are leading by example. So, but do you think this is enough to give renewable energy proponents a reason to cheer? with you with some caveats. Uh, on the surface of it, what has been described by this deal is um, a direct displacement of emissions. And like Mustafa said as well, you know, with the wind generated energy from this project would be directly replacing fossil fuel generated energy, which of course is in line with um, Egypt's current um, focus following COP27. Um, it's just important to look at this from a different, um, a slightly nuanced lens, I would say. What is what we're seeing here is what is often referred to as scope one emissions, which refers to a direct replacement, which is obviously a positive thing in this context. However, with green projects, what is often ignored that even within the renewable context and within renewable projects, there is some emissions related to that, which is often indirect. So for example, the manufacture of the turbines um, for this project, the actual running of the power system, there is of, um, definitely emissions relating to that. And these are often less talked about. And I would say that in summary, the focus should always be on the net impact and not necessarily always on the headline number that is presented as part of um, deals such as these.
Mustafa, but we need a uh, diversified energy mix, and, and we, can't, uh, we can't underplay that uh, in any way. So do, do you think this wind project will help uh, Egypt reach that threshold in terms of about sourcing about 42% of its energy renewable by the year 2030? I'm sure uh, Kenya, that you mentioned, the, the Tokana region, is to, Egypt, uh, Kenya is also trying very strongly to, to, to reach as, 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 as a higher threshold as, as quickly as possible. Yes, absolutely. It is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, it was spoken about at the COP27, just like it was spoken in 26 and, and even bef before that. Um, yes, diversification is very important. You know, having a diversified energy mix is very important. Um, I think one of the key objectives that you can achieve with that is energy security. So, you know, when you have energy security, uh, you know, then you're able to develop even from an economic perspective at a, at a much faster rate. Um, if you look at um, you know, the quintessential or common energy sources that we have. You're talking about crude oil, natural gas, coal. These are commodities that are hinged to market forces. And when you have a situation whereby uh, there are, you know, uh, you know, there are different uh, factors within the markets that could potentially impact these commodities, then you're also susceptible to, to them. You could have geopolitical tensions, for example, like we saw with Russia and Ukraine, uh, impacts the prices of natural gas and, and crude oil, and that could even affect your company from, you know, exorbitant prices and just general disruptions. So it's very important to have the energy mix, like you have in Canada, for example, you know, they have hydropower, coal, crude oil. So energy security, that's, that's the aim that here in Africa we're trying to reach. And, you know, these are steps in the right direction, definitely. Okay, so if we take this uh, home, uh, I want you to find in terms of Nigeria's energy mix, which is basically hydro and gas as we speak. Uh, I want you to weigh in on the importance of a diverse energy portfolio here for Nigeria as well, as we've seen a number of African countries trying to make very strong headways, Egypt, Morocco, uh, South Africa, as well as uh, uh, Kenya. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the it's very clear that, um, you know, energy diversity would bring resilience to the sector. For far too long, we've relied primarily on hydropower and as well gas powered supply, which of course has its own challenges. On the hydro side, you have to deal with sort of water levels at the, uh, at the dams and so on. And of course, the potential environmental impact from hydropowered plants and gas supply as well, heavily reliant on infrastructure, which um, is one of the challenges that we have um, within the Nigerian context. So I think that di um, diversity, that wind and, um, you know, for example, also extending towards solar powered um, energy would certainly bring resilience and help to develop capacity in the energy space as well. Um, I mean, frankly, we don't have sufficient um, power to, to, to take um, the country to where we want to be. And I think additional sources of electricity, I would say, will be very um, welcome in the Nigerian context. Uh, so here we are with uh, fossil fuel advocates saying we can no longer drill. Some folks say we should just continue to use what we have to get energy poverty out of the, out of the door for us in Africa. So what do you think uh, about this pushback from climate activists who are asking banks in Europe and elsewhere not to fund hydrocarbon uh, uh, operations on the African continent? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's, 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 it has risen some level of controversy. You know, within Africa, within the African context, you know, adopting fossil fuels, uh, you know, uh, conforming to many of the standards that have been set at many of these COP uh, conferences. Uh, but I think it's very important to look at things in, in context. So many of the people that are advocating uh, or that, you know, criticizing the people who are calling for uh, uh, fossil fuel, um, uh, you know, to, you know, to let go of fossil fuel in Africa, what you see is that uh, there's this highlighting of some level of hypocrisy from a lot of these developed countries. So, for example, uh, at the COP26, um, we saw a lot of these countries, developed nations, it's, it's like it was a platform for them to come out and call out the sins of developing nations about how they need to let go of fossil fuels and coal. But what we saw just barely a year after that was that many of these countries in Europe, they opened up their, their, you know, their, um, their plants whereby they used uh, coal. They started importing coal. Coal uh, over a year went up by 43% in terms of importation from Indonesia and many of these countries. So. And what was the reason why a lot of these European countries did that? It was because 
the situation was kind of dire, right? Um, they were having issues with Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine, and they needed another source of energy. So it, it highlights that level of hypocrisy. But however, should we in Africa now decide that, oh, because uh, a lot of these European countries have done that, we should keep on uh, uh, using fossil fuels without, without budging? No, of course, you know, because obviously when you, you know, when there's an eye for an eye, everybody becomes blind, right? Climate change is something that affects everyone. So it's important for us to uh, acknowledge the fact that we also are trying to go through our own industrial revolution phase. And uh, I think a lot, a lot of focus should be on energy addition. And I think when that is sufficient, then we can now start to see full implementation of energy transition. And I think it's very important to just realize the context of what we're having these discussions, whether it's in developing nations or developed nations. I want if how do you what what are your thoughts around balancing our energy portfolios between dirty energy, clean energy on the African continent, joining the global energy conversation, but still using our natural resources to push back on our energy deficiency on the continent, uh, pursue renewables like Egypt is currently doing, whether we're doing hydro, gas, we're doing hydrogen, whatever it is, green energy. No, I mean, I think I, I would just like to echo Mustafa's thoughts on this. I think this ties directly um, with the earlier point on the right energy mix and striking the right balance. Um, Africa is not ready to abandon fossil fuels, and that's just really where we are as a continent. And any attempt to push for that you know, from the West, I, I believe, and this is my opinion, should be vehemently opposed. Um, we have significant energy poverty across Africa. And, and I, I say this loosely, of course, because each country within the block experiences this in its own unique way. However, the challenge is there and the challenge is clear across the block. On a cap, um, per capita basis, um, Africa on the whole uses, you know, between five to 10% per capita of what the average Western world uses. So it's frankly unfair at this point to sort of box us into the renewable bucket, which of course requires significant funding, um, which is not frankly not forthcoming at this point in time. Um, at the same time, we need to strike the balance and start to look into the future in terms of introducing renewable sources of energy which you know the continent is quite blessed to be able to harness from wind to solar and so on. <clears throat> Interesting, uh, Mustafa. So uh, here we are. When you look at the concrete, tangible jobs that could be created from investing in renewables, look at Boa Cement, for example. Boa Group just got five hundred million dollars from IFC to support green production of cement in northern Nigeria. Do you think we will be able to get? more FDI such as that if we try to do our path in joining the whole green energy revolution, globally speaking. Yes, absolutely. And this was highlighted at the last call because the last call was held here in Africa, in Egypt. Um, and we also saw some initiatives come out of that, uh, like the um, I, AI, AICM, uh, AICM, ACMI, yes. sorry, ACMI, yes. uh, where we had our former vice president also part of that uh, Part of, part of that board. Yes. So definitely a lot of eyes are, are, looking at, are looking at Africa, but we also need to definitely do our part, like you mentioned. You know, there's significant deforestation, which is something that helps, you know, because forest is something that helps to take a lot of effects of uh, CO2 emissions. Yeah. And even in terms of the global trend as well, we're seeing that it's looking very promising. Um, as of 2021, within the renewable energy space, there were 12.7 million jobs, and this is a 75% jump from 2012. Right? So that's quite significant. 5.4 million of those 12.7 million jobs are from China alone. And that echoes a lot of the efforts that China has taken in order to uh, significantly develop its renewable energy sources, uh, whether it's in hydro, it's in wind, or it's in, it's in solar. So these are definitely examples that we can look, look towards. Uh, just last year alone, we saw jobs within the uh, renewable energy space rise by about 9%. Right? And the um, ACMI, which I mentioned earlier, well, we have uh, about 30 million jobs which really projected could, could have been made uh, by 2030 and 100 million jobs by 2050. So there's definitely significant uh, promise in terms of uh, employment, in terms of job creation and job, um, job opportunities in that space. And here in Africa, uh, we're already taking some steps. We are seeing within Egypt, within Kenya, and even within Nigeria to some extent with the NMPCL, even though, you know, of, of course, it's not to the levels of, of Egypt yet. The, the, the NMPC New Energy Initiative. Thing. Yes, with yes. the New Energy Initiative, yes. even with uh, some of the efforts that have been taken to, uh, to um, acquire some downstream assets in order to uh, disperse uh, more 
uh, more alternative sources of energy aside from the typical or quintessential uh, uh, fossil fuels that we have now. So uh, we're definitely on, on that right track and there's definitely large uh, um, job creation opportunities. Uh, if, uh, in our best interest, uh, any other benefits that you think renewables can add to uh, this conversation, the way we're moving forward uh, as we begin to wrap up this conversation? Uh, give me any other, top it up for me from what uh, uh, my, my friend here has said so far. Yeah, thank you. I think one last point, I think, from me would be for us to look at to view renewable energy as being complementary to our existing sources of power. So for example, in order to leverage renewable sources of energy, it's important to have a stable base load um, from more traditional sources such as thermal fired plants um, and hydro, which are largely more predictable than wind and solar sources, which are again, dependent on weather and climate conditions. So I think that's another lens um, by which we should be looking at this. Eventually in the long run, we expect that renewables will start to you know, form a larger component of the energy mix. But at this point, whilst we are focused on the base load, we should also be considering renewables as a complementary source at this time. Thank you so much, uh, Tolu Awinfa out of London and Mustafa Alao out of uh, Lagos here. Thank you so much, both of you. It's good to have you here discussing this very important uh, conversation.